and welcome to Legally Speaking with me, Tarun Nagya. Uh, I'm happy to comment on part three of this very successful series of ours that we have titled uh, Turning Civil Dispute into a Criminal Case to Force Settlement with the Other Party. It is unfortunate that these things happen and that's why we have to be aware about what all happens. What is the remedy? And in part third, we are going to discuss uh, what if one falls victim to such a scheme and what is the remedy? Uh, and we also discussed thing reforms the last time. So let me first of all welcome Advocate Vikram Singh, partner Circle of Councils uh, on part three. Happy to see you to be joining me for the part three of this really, really interesting subject. Thank you, Tyron. It's lovely to have you again. And I apologize to my viewers that we took some time but nonetheless, I agree that this particular subject matter uh, is something which will intrigue everyone uh, for some time to come. Thank you, Tarun. So Thank you for being with me on the show. My pleasure. Looking forward to some interesting insights from you as in the past two episodes that uh, you have uh, done on legally speaking. Uh, and at the outset, I want to ask you, uh, what do you advise the people who are watching you now or hearing you now, now on their mobile phones? Or watching you live, or uh, watching you uh, uh, in transit, in travel, in a plane, because they are all watching you with interest. They want to know if one becomes a victim uh, to a false criminal complaint when there is a contractual breach by the other side, and he fixes you in a fake complaint. What is the remedy? Thank you, Tarun. That's a very relevant question for the masses as such because uh, we have been discussing the various reasons behind this practice. We have also been discussing in our previous episodes what are the reforms which must be implemented to eradicate this uh, uh, legal terrorism which is being unleashed lately by private parties and lately the optics of the states are also getting diluted which I'll address in the end. But yes, a very relevant question that what if the person is a victim of such malicious and false prosecution, wherein a civil dispute is being alleged as a criminal uh, uh, offense by the other side. Now, see, as your question suggests, what if the proceedings have been fostered and they have started by virtue of an FIR as such? Now, what is most important, my friend, is to ensure that the person must not react in a knee-jerk manner. Agreed, this is something illegal terrorism which is being alleged. But at the same time, the first step must be to immediately contact your legal counsel, who is an expert on this particular subject matter. And thereafter, what he counsels you proceed accordingly. And which in my limited understanding will be that if there is an FIR, you must take a step forward towards the law enforcement agency, then be reluctant and join the investigation immediately as such. Once you present yourself before the law enforcement authority and once they appraise you, whether you have a copy of the FIR in advance or they make you familiarize that what is the subject matter, no matter you may have apprehended that with this particular complainant, I have this particular transaction with him, most likely it has to emanate from there. But nonetheless, joining immediately sends the optics to the law enforcement agency that this man is not afraid to join the investigation. Maybe the complaint or the complainant has not discovered or has not stated correct facts and uh, the confidence of the other person joining the investigation sends a very strong message to the LEA, that is the police, who deals with, who, as I stated, so the police is foremost responsible for eradicating this problem. So the prompt response joining the investigation helps to a great extent. Now, the obvious question is, the people are only reluctant and evasive is because they apprehend a coercive step by the hands of LEA as such. It is very important to see that uh, just like uh, if you look antecedent and if you look in past, there has been various instances that various laws have been abused by uh, 
respective parties as such. Like for example, the law Dowry Act has been abused, but today everybody knows that most of the complaints are false and mischievous. It is uh, regretful that uh, sometimes the correct complaints and the true complaints also get diluted by the sheer number of false complaints raining on the heads of law enforcement agencies. Similarly, just like there has been abuse of uh, proviso related to the offenses against women, the law enforcement agencies and the courts, they are all waking up to this problem as it's been there for last few years that we may not treat the allegation and the complaint, especially in an economic offense, as gospel truth. So once you immediately take a step forward, participate in the investigation, share your exculpatory fact and evidence, even without a, a formal reply, merely an interaction with the investigation officer and your confidence to address his concern, your ability to submit a, a counter fact and a counter evidence, which is which uh, is exculpatory in nature, goes to a great extent. To uh, I mean, I must admit that. Uh, uh, to do away uh, with your uh, liberty so that you feel confident the other person also appreciate and at the same time it is the right step in the direction before we even think of adopting any judicial remedy. Well, uh, uh, I want to ask you a question which I am curious about as I heard your answer. Uh, do you think it is very tough sometimes uh, if it is a very well-planned case where one is framed do you think it can be very overwhelming for the victim? Uh, how, what is the importance of the right legal guidance at such a time? A very good question once again and relevant as well. Now, Tarun, see, yes, if the complainant is habitual with this process, he has indulged in such kind of uh, uh, abuse of process of law, on previous occasions, naturally the confidence of the complainant will multiply that if he has succeeded prior in this particular malpractice to achieve his dubious means, he will adopt once again uh, to another innocent person. In those scenarios, what is the need of the R is that it is just not the law enforcement agency, but at the right time, challenging those particular FIR where the pecuniary element runs into hundreds and 200 of crore and Sometimes even law enforcement authorities are evasive to even grant you relief when in their conscience they believe that the person opposite to me deserves the relief. So in those instances, I strongly recommend that uh, the litigants and the victims must uh, request and implore for the indulgence of the court as such. Because the indulgence of superior courts at this critical juncture goes to a great extent to dilute the risk of arrest to ensure that once the risk of arrest has diluted no matter for the interim period that you can step forward and whosoever may have used any nefarious means to uh, curtail your liberty and to put you under duress and to extort money or a settlement out of you as was the uh, this is the motive behind all these kind of uh, uh, maneuvers by uh, mischievous litigants, then to that extent it gets uh, diminished grossly and then it becomes a regular affair. And trust me on this, that the Honorable High Courts and all superior courts, even courts which are granting bail, they are becoming quite conscious to this problem and they give a patient hearing. And nonetheless, a person usually is successful in an economic defense if he has a formidable defense and he puts it something very contrary before the desk of the learned officer and they appreciate the same and he gets Even the right legal guidance is very important in the, that it can be called a trap case where you're trying to trap an innocent victim. Yes. Yes, I agree with you. See, the situation is very fragile as well and the position of any individual against whom such a serious allegation exists is also very vulnerable. It is a legal mind who can balance between ensuring that the liberty of the person is not curtailed or taken away and ensuring at the same time, which is also very important because most of the time people lose their liberty 
because they do not cooperate and participate in the investigation and by their inadvertent conduct of being evasive and afraid of procedure and joining the investigation, they also give an impression to the agencies that they are creating impediments in the progress of the investigation which nobody is going to appreciate. On one hand, the optics are that I am calling an accused, he is not presenting himself for joining the investigation. On the contrary, the other gentleman is also right that he is well afraid because there is no surety that he is going to return back home once he goes uh, uh, to the station to join the investigation. <laughs> the right counselling by the uh, colleagues, by legal minds come into play. But nonetheless, what I said before, and I repeat, there must not be a knee-jerk reaction. It is not the end of the road and nobody can coerce a settlement out of you if you know your rights and you know how to exercise them. Now, last time in the last show, you spoke about what police can do to eradicate this menace that we are countering as a society. In your view and opinion, what the courts can do to end this problem or reduce it to a great extent? Yes. See, one of the uh, nucleus factor in the entire matrix of discussion is the liberty of the person which is involved. It is that liberty which forces him to settle. It is that uh, freedom which he enjoys that he does not want any compromise on the same, which also to a great extent leads to settlement and uh, the extortion activities of the complainant become successful. So first of all, I believe in this particular kind of case, as I stated so, that the law enforcement agencies have been strictly directed that they must not indulge in indiscriminate arrest and give an opportunity to the other side to participate in investigation. In the similar manner, the honorable courts, no matter what is the gravity of the allegation in an economic offence? Ensure that the interim protection by way of very strict conditions so that the people may also not uh, take the courts for a ride. They must also not take the precious liberty which is being given to them for granted. In a very strict manner, some kind of preliminary interlocutory relief from the courts must be given and the courts must be liberal in dealing with economic offences as such, wherein there is an allegation that he say that it was a mere business failure lordship, it was not my intention not to return the public money back to them. Okay. Are they are. Now, uh, if I take this issue uh, on what the members of the bar the elders of the bar, the senior of the members of the bar, the bar at large, uh, the thinking minds at the bar who think about uh, the legal ecosystem in, in this country, uh, the issue of enforcement of law, the issue of the rule of law in this country, uh, what should they and they can do for this? The learned members of bar who are more emancipated and way much more learned than me. It is a difficult question, but nonetheless, I'll try to address the same. See, first of all, we are the officers of the court. We are the persons who are the mouthpiece of the litigant. And we are the persons to whom they, uh, there can be an invisible touch by us at all levels, at the level of police, across the desk counseling with the client, and also with the learned members of the bench as well. We play the key role. We are the ones who connect all the dots in any legal anomaly as such. So first of all, I believe that we must give adequate time to the client and the matter collectively. Sometimes we are having paucity of time. There are legal luminaries who are so busy that they say simply say that, oh, we will address your matter, don't worry, but we have no time to sit and interact with you doesn't work this way because there is a mind which is overcasted with absolute ambiguity sitting across you. You may have, a, we may have an experience of dealing with this situation. We may be confident enough to deal with the same nonetheless. But the other party who is uh, a client to us, to uh, my fellow colleagues, if we spend some time with them, 
explain the entire matrix of facts and the remedies which are there in law. I believe to a great extent, not only it will uh, eradicate or dilute this particular evil, but also it will ensure that the confidence of citizens into the legal system and especially criminal justice system multiplies as such. Because the more confident the litigants get, the more discouraged will be uh, malicious prosecution by this uh, notorious particular uh, litigants who indulge in such manner in the first place. Now, it's always uh, easier said than done. But as a legal counsel, we have to ensure that we must with iron hand also ensure that the clients also are equally ethical if and equally integral if they expect such results from the other side. Counsels must not tell the client that for petty gains, for short periods, they are evasive to the agencies. I'll just give a very small illustration. There is a case of forgery. There is a case of cheating. Then for resolution of every judicial review or a trial, what is required? The evidence, correct? First of all, they must be told by counsels, then don't worry, nobody is going to manufacture false evidence against you. We live in a modern India. This never happened in colonial times as well. What is there? Inevitably, it will surface on the charge sheet and the final investigation. Now, there are some kinds of evidence which are in exclusive possession and custody of the client. Then there is some kind of evidence which is in public domain maybe like your bank statement, you talk to them, they just get uh, jump uh, on the chair, oh, he's asking, my own lawyer is asking me to submit my own bank statement. Why should I do that? So this is very important that we must not let the mitigating circumstances to come into existence by the inadvertent and uh, uh, ignorance of the clients towards their duty uh, towards law enforcement agencies and the court says that, that they come under the fear of arrest. For example, there is an allegation of forgery. You not, have not done anything. There are tools of forgery involved in it. There is an IT Act matter. They want to seize your laptop. They want to seize your computer. Please give it to them. By cooperation, you are diluting the grounds of arrest. You're not letting any circumstance comes into play by which a learned investigation officer can write in his guard file that I have grounds of arrest against this particular accused person. Who will do that? He doesn't know. The courts will judge you on these uh, demeanors. The court will take a conscious decision on, these, uh, on this conduct of the client. And you have to tell him that nothing will go against you. This is expected by law and you're doing the right thing. So such instances, I can say, that uh, really goes to a great extent and acting as counsels as a bridge to ensure that we navigate our client through these troubled waters. Another instance, I'll give it to you. See, I believe in one thing, Karan. Come what may, we must fight for our liberty to the last breath. When we have not done anything wrong, Nothing in the world, no force can stop me from proving myself that I'm innocent. And I agree that lately, uh, I don't want to go into the law of bail or something, but still the courts uh, and the system, criminal justice administrative system here, is not appreciating the fact that decades back, the, uh, uh, the courts made reference case laws on this. And I mean the case law which can be referred as a common uh, case law for the liberty of a person. That a person can defend himself better outside a prison than naturally he can inside in the first place. So in that extent, I also am willing to counsel my client that you live another day to fight. Why not even deposit the same amount in the court if he can afford the same so that the truth surface. There are various ways. It depends how we counsel the client as such. So, bar uh, nonetheless, I believe, is at the helm of any 
or every legal anomaly or imbalance which is into the criminal justice system. It is very important for us as officers of the court to ensure that the client understand the nuances of law and procedure and compliance. And we can also prove to the honorable bench and learned judges that lordship, things as they may be stand, but this man is innocent and look at the conduct. And from where does it come? From the counseling. So the client needs equal time as the matter itself. And this goes to a great length to ensure that the system smoothens itself and it basically throws out such malpractices on it. Thank you. Thank you so much for this enlightening three-part series. So many promoters, general counsels, the legal community, uh, small traders and businessmen, uh, people, individual consultants, they all have been victim to such cases, as you have also highlighted. Uh, uh, the society should end this malpractice, but nevertheless, the person who faces a false case, how is he to defend himself? You shared with us in this three-part series. It was indeed a pleasure talking to you. Looking forward to more such shows in the future on such topics, because I think devious minds will figure out newer and newer ways to frame people. And I think we will seek your indulgence and interviews to know more on how to counter such issues in different era, areas or arenas of life. Thank you so much for your time and thank you viewers for joining me. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. And thank you. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.